Yes, uh, welcome here to the lecture series, to the joint lecture series um, of many uh, entrepreneurial universities and universities of applied sciences here in the uh, Frankfurt Rhine Main area. I'm very glad to have you here. Really looking forward to uh, having Carlos here. Carlos Miragal, thanks for being here. Hi. <laughs> Say a word so we see you in the recorded video. Hello, I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Hi, you're um, sitting in close to Valencia in Spain. Um, thanks for joining us during your, your holidays and being uh, willing to share um, one of your many experiences today with us. Um, but let me start introducing uh, the lecture series and uh, explain to people what's, uh, what they're expecting uh, or can expect from the coming 45 minutes, because we're not going for the 90 minutes, but we're going to make it more compact um, and still be able to have all the content in it, Carlos, right? So I hope you see the slides. So welcome to the joint lecture series, uh, Wired for Success. Uh, that's a bold claim, but we wanted to clickbait a little with the title. Um, it's about business modeling, especially for startups and especially, especially for tech startups. That's at least Carlos' background. Um, and I'm really glad to have you here. I think many of us realized in the past um, years and, and maybe decade uh, that this is a skill set and a knowledge set that we definitely need more in, in not just in Germany, but all over the world to be able to be um, viable for the future and to be, uh, yes, to stay innovative. Um, we have a very, very strong um, middle sized um, companies in the market, but you're, you're supposed to be those of the future. Um, so we want to be make we want to make sure to prepare and equip you for that future. And today is about uh, business modeling for startups. So Carlos, uh, I'm very very happy to have you here, digitally at least. You're uh, close mm -hmm. to Valencia, so if you're sweating, that's totally fine with us. Uh, thanks for being here, anyways. You're an angel investor yourself, and um, you've been or still are the CFO, portfolio CFO, or interim CFO. For a couple of startups, you had to raise more than 50 million uh, bucks um, to be able to burn them again <laughs> as a CFO, <laughs> and you have deep knowledge. So I'm very, very happy and thankful that you're here, Carlos. The stage is yours. So let's dive into it. First, let's uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Carlos. Uh, obviously, it's not a, a German name. Um, I'm, I'm from Spain. I'm actually spending the summer in Spain, although my uh, current home uh, is Frankfurt. I'm uh, by education, I'm an engineer. I also studied economics and I got a uh, master in business administration. And I started my career doing operations. Uh, actually, what I'd like to say is I've had several professional lives and I think that is more and more common everywhere. And that's actually very, very useful if you're going to um, to, to be an entrepreneur. I started doing operations. I moved to consulting. I've been a founder myself, uh, uh, where like, obviously I, I had, I wore many hats, um, but my official job title was COO slash CFO. I've been a professional CFO. And currently I'm what some people call a portfolio CFO or fractional CFO. So I work, uh, one or two or three days per week with different clients being their, their CFO because early stage companies many times cannot afford uh, a full-time one. Um, as Dominic mentioned, I've raised quite a few millions, uh, both for my own company, Nextail, uh, which was a retail SaaS business. Uh, and I raised uh, friends and family, Seed and Series A, and also some bank financing. Uh, as well as for Panacea, which is a cybersecurity uh, tech SaaS, where I raised a Series B of more than $25 million and a venture debt facility. And currently, I very recently closed uh, another round, a pre-Series A round for UMED, one of the companies I'm doing fractional CFO for. I've also, uh, I'm also, and I started like a couple of years ago, uh, done some angel investments. Uh, mostly in SaaS companies, um, either in retail or um, in AI, uh, like deep, deep, deep tech. I like deep tech. I like deep technological uh, uh, intellectual property at the core of a startup, as well as a, a, as I'm an, an LP, a limited partner in some small funds that invest in Y Combinator startups. 
why am I telling you this? Uh, number one is for you to, to know my background a little bit better, but also because what I want to share is basically the things that I've learned over the years where I have had the opportunity to either prepare or review or analyze uh, a lot of business plans and business models. And um, I basically want to share some learnings about what I think the best startups I've met have in terms of their business model, okay? And, and there are just three things. I think they have a clear business model that is consistent with the company strategy and uh, um, we'll see in a moment what that means. I think they have strong unit economics and I'll explain also what that means in more detail and uh, with a couple of examples, because as Dominic said, we want this to be hands-on and they have a good handle on costs. So any questions so far? No, it's clear, okay. Um, Seems like so, three mistakes I've made in my startups. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with business model consistent with company strategy. And let, let's start from the beginning. Um, what is a startup? And um, I came across a definition of startup that I like very much. Uh, and maybe, uh, Dominic, this links to what you just said. Um, if, you, if you've read Steve Blank, the author of Lean Startup, uh, which is a great book, I recommend it. A startup is just an organization looking for a scalable and repeatable business model. So that's, that's what a startup is. It's not about the product, it's not about the customers, it's about scalable and repeatable business model. Yeah. Now the question is, okay, what is a business model? Yeah. Uh, well, you can look it up in Wikipedia and it's actually a little bit of a complex definition it's about how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Um, and it's very linked to business strategy. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I like this definition. It's a little bit too academic. If instead of Wikipedia, you just Google uh, business model, I like this. It's a company's plan for making a profit. So, so this is what a business model is. It's how do you make money? And that's, that's the question that a business model should answer, okay? Um, now, we said before that startups are organizations looking for a scalable and repeatable business model. So I guess the question is, what happens once you found uh, this business model that is scalable and repeatable? And that's... Uh, I like it, uh, and again, Steve Blank uh, is the guru I've used for this slide. Uh, in his book, The Startup Owner's Manual, he has this, this chart, uh, because basically once you found a scalable and repeatable business model, you stop being a startup. You transition into, he calls it a company, some other people call it a scale up. And that's when you just aim at just growing by putting more fuel into your tank, more gas, which is uh, difficult today uh, in the current context. Uh, sorry for the for the for the job, but you just put money and you continue growing until you become cash flow break even and even profitable. Okay, so this is what business models are. Now let's look at business models in the context of technology uh, and startups, and and there are a lot of different business models, different ways of making money. Um, some people just give their product for free, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, Facebook and Google. Uh, you can give your product for free. They have a lot of products, by the way. I mean, it's not just Facebook and Google. You have Gmail, you have G Drive, you have Instagram, you have WhatsApp. And then they make money on advertising. Actually, what some people say is, in this case, you are the product, not, not, not Google. Other companies uh, use what they call a freemium model, which is, uh, in, in layman terms, try before you buy. Uh, something like Dropbox, uh, uh, you can have, uh, or, or Spotify, you can have like the free version. Uh, and then if you want, you can sign up for a paid version. 
or some companies use an on-demand model, like uh, when you rent a video from uh, Apple TV. Yeah? Um, a very common model in startups, and there are, we, we will see that uh, in more detail, is the e-commerce model, which is the traditional retail. So you just sell stuff uh, from a website um, and charge for it. So I think, yeah, here. Obviously, the biggest um, e-commerce site on earth is Amazon. A similar uh, or related, not similar, but related model is marketplace, uh, which is when you actually, you sell something on your website, but instead of you owning that, you are an intermediary, you are a marketplace. You put in touch buyers of something with sellers or something. The classic canonical example is eBay, huh? or if you want, Uber X, you know, like you put in touch buyers of, of, of transport with supply of transport with people that have private cars in the US, because in Europe there were regulations that prevented that. Um, another model, it's the uh, so called ecosystem model, where a strong brand and some compatibility issues prevent you from buying things from other people and just ask you to buy. From them, like Apple, I'm 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 guilty of being captive in the Apple ecosystem. I have an iPhone, I have AirPods, I have a MacBook, and really I cannot move to 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 a different system now because it would like it would make my life so much harder having to move all my data and information and getting used to a new system. Right? Um, Another, another, another business model, it's uh, called the sharing model, um, whereby, and that was very, very big uh, a few years ago, like the sharing economy or the gig economy. Uh, I guess a big example of this is Airbnb, uh, where you own fixed assets, you know, like your flat uh, or your car or things like that. Um, and a company allows you to share, to, to, to sell or to rent those to third, to, to third, third party, to, to, to other people um, temporarily, right? Like Airbnb. Another business model uh, is so-called the experience model, an example being Tesla, where you, you're not just buying a car, you're buying much more than that, you know? Um, another one, the subscription model or software as a service, um, two examples, uh, Salesforce or Adobe. Uh, and again, like the e-commerce uh, one, we will look at this in much more detail. And finally, finally on this list, by the way, which is, as I say on the slide, non-exhaustive, you have the open source model. Uh, an example is a company called Red Hat. Um, uh, not sure if you're familiar with uh, with that, but Red Hat produced a Linux distribution, which is an operating system, and it gave it away for free, uh, and then made money by charging mostly big companies services to use Linux, which uh, was actually very widely used in in the server space. So these are some examples of business models of how, and as I said. This is just how companies make money, how companies make profits, you know? And most of the companies that I list in the examples are making uh, big profits uh, out of this business model. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So as I said, uh, oops, um, sorry about that. As I said, uh, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into uh, two of those because they are the most common ones. One, the one, the the e-commerce model, and second, the subscription or software as a service model. I, I'd have a question if if that's okay too. <laughs> um, a startup or a business itself can't only have one uh, business model. But um, the, for example, if you're talking about Facebook or Google, they have multiple um, products. Uh, is it okay to have multiple business models uh, as long as you have the overview or what's your take on that? Yeah, you're anticipating something that I'll cover in the third learning. In the, in, uh, so 
I would say, now let's take a step back. Um, what we said before about what is a startup is an organization looking for a reputable and scalable business model. So it's okay to experiment, but as like the trade-off is if you're experimenting and you have a lot of different things going on, you're probably not focusing on a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So experiment, but once you find something that works, just focus on that because you're too small to have too many product lines and too many business models at the same time. Did I answer question? Okay, <laughs> good. So let's look at e-commerce a little bit. And I want to look at e-commerce because um, later on, we're gonna talk about unit economics and the same thing for software as a service. Um, so what is e-commerce? It's probably the most popular digital model ever, you know, like buying and selling stuff is old as the world. Nowadays, it's very easy there's a lot of technology and actually they take a little bit of your of a little bit of your margin that enable you to set up an e-commerce website in a matter of minutes maybe and there are millions of them like just at shopify uh if you look at the numbers there's more than 1.7 million websites and that's that's the biggest probably, but there are a lot of other platforms that enable you to run an e-commerce website. So it's huge. Um, the other very common business model is what people call software as a service. And again, it's become ubiquitous, ubiquitous. Uh, it's everywhere. Um, organizations, there, this, is, this is a real data. Organizations with more than a thousand employees use more than 150 software as a service applications. Um, you can see some examples here. And by the way, I've used, in the companies I consult and the companies, startup companies that I work with uh, as a fractional CFO, I use all of these tools. Yeah. Uh, but but software as a service is not, just, or subscriptions is not just a model for, for companies. It's not just B2B, business to business. It can also be business to consumer. Just think how many subscriptions you yourself have, you know? Starting with your, you know, like your, your, your phone or your DSL or fiber from uh, Magenta or, 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 or O2, uh, your gym subscription to like uh, your streaming from Disney Plus or, or Netflix, uh, your music from Spotify or, or Apple, uh, Prime Video, Tom, Strava, and so on and so forth. So like, to be honest, I haven't counted them, but I think I have more than 40, so I, and myself, I have more than 40 subscriptions for my personal use, right? And I'm sure you're probably uh, uh, the same case. Any questions on the e-commerce or software as a service business models and examples and what they mean? When you talked about e-commerce, uh, you had uh, very different things on your slide, um, which are partially also more supportive, like this Amazon fulfillment or Stripe. So, that is not in the core of e-commerce, but it's all services this, that support e-commerce of others, right? Yeah, yeah. My, my, uh, my point was that um, just uh, because the e-commerce the e business model is very simple, is to just sell goods. Yeah. My point was that technology enables it, enables to do it very cheaply and efficiently yeah. because you have all the, you, you, you basically, you don't need, apart from deciding your brand, your domain name, and what what are what what are you gonna sell online? Everything else, you can find a tool to do it for you, like your 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 payments, your warehousing through Amazon fulfillment, your website through Shopify. Everything can be taken care of through a different tool. Right? Okay. Um, so once we have a little bit of clarity on what a business model is and a little bit more insight into some specific examples of business models. Let's talk about unique economics. Um, and this might sound a little bit academic, 
uh, at the beginning, but we will do a couple of examples because um, this is a very important concept uh, for startups to be successful. Okay? Uh, so what are unit economics? And again, you can Google it. And they say, if you Google it, it says that it refers to a company's revenues and costs related to an individual unit of production. So either it's one transaction, one sale, or one customer, or something like that, uh, an individual unit of production. And what we're talking about is about what's the revenue that this individual unit of production is bringing to your company and what's, what are the costs that this individual unit of production is, is, is causing your company to have. And, and, and why are they important? And uh, well, uh, there's, there's a lot of literature, but this is basically microeconomics. This is about fixed and variable costs. And the thing is, digital technologies and digital uh, and, and, and tech startups that are typically based on digital technologies have high initial fixed costs. If, you, for example, if you are if you're gonna offer a, a software product, you need to spend money on developing that software, and that's your fixed cost, and, and that's high. And actually, also, it's unknown. It's going to be big and we don't know how big. Um, at the same time, the variable cost is what each customer transaction needs to cover, right? For you to make money. Um, and that's the unit economics. And a third aspect is that in tech startups, many times digital businesses have huge markets because Basically, the world is full of potential customers for you. Particularly if you do business to consumer, like Amazon or Netflix or Apple, but even if you're developing a solution that is for some companies, you can deliver that solution over the internet anywhere in the world, which makes your market huge many times, right? So that's why unit economics are important. It's because we're gonna look at the variable cost. So the, like whether we're covering variable costs because we need to, in, ultimately your startup needs to cover its fixed costs as well. But we know, or we think if it's a startup, if we're talking about startups, that the market is very big. So how do startups measure their unit economics. Um, so what they look at is two concepts that I want to explain here, and we'll do an example. One is the lifetime value of a customer, and the other one is how much it costs to acquire that customer, which typically it's called the customer acquisition cost. And what the practitioners try to do and the investors look at is whether it costs you one third of what you get uh, of a customer to acquire it. So whether your lifetime value is at least three times bigger than your customer acquisition cost. If it's less than three, you are in trouble. If it's bigger than five, that's amazing. You're probably unicorn at some point. So how do we calculate lifetime value? So let's look at an example for e-commerce. And the lifetime value is how much value, the definition is how much value you get from a customer that goes to your website over the whole life, or over the whole period that that customer is gonna be a customer of yours. And we can decompose that in three, in three concepts, one is, how much value we get from that customer every time he buys. Number two, how often does he buy? Does he buy per period? So let's say per year. And second, how many years is he gonna be buying for us? Right, that will on average. That, that's, that's gonna take us, that's gonna give us the whole average, uh, the whole lifetime value. Looking at, uh, 
at uh, the first component, the average value for, uh, per transaction, we typically look at uh, uh, in accounting terms at gross margins. So in the case of an e-commerce, let's imagine we have set up a, a website to sell t-shirts online uh, for $19.99. I hope it's a good price. Um, you would look at $19.99 is the revenue per transaction, but actually the money, the margin that as a company you get for that transaction is slightly lower than that. And that's because obviously you have to subtract how much it costs you to buy or produce that t-shirt, how much it costs you to ship it, deliver it to your customer, how much you have to pay to Stripe or whatever you're using or to Visa to, uh, to, to uh, um, uh, process the transaction from a credit card. And also you have to allow uh, for potential returns because some customers uh, don't like what they buy and you are obliged by law to accept the returns and refund their money. So after you subtract all of that, that's your margin uh, for each sale, which in this example would be around $12 or 12 euros. Uh, and that would be your average value per, per transaction. We're not done yet. We need to understand how many transactions each customer does and for how long they're gonna be a customer of ours. And if you look uh, at e-commerce, it's actually a repeat business. And, uh, and I'm sure you get uh, as many emails as I do from websites where I have bought or where I have tried to buy something and they're continuously emailing you and spamming you trying to get you to buy more. Either things like, oh, if you bought this, you're gonna like this or uh, become a member and get a discount or let's, make this, let's use this occasion to buy something for somebody else or, or something like that. Uh, and the reason why they're, all these websites are doing this is because they want to increase the number of transactions per period and increase the lifetime value of you as a customer of theirs. Yeah? So let's assume that on average in this hypothetical e-commerce um, e uh, t-shirt uh, website that we set up, we uh, get to two, two transactions per year. For uh, on average from our customers. And let's look at customer lifetime, uh, sorry, customer lifespan. So a customer lifespan is how long will a customer remain a customer of ours? Now, if I look at myself, for example, um, I remember I bought the first time from Amazon in 1998. Um, they were like a two years old company and I bought them from, I, I bought from Spain. They delivered to Spain. They have not opened anything in Europe yet. And I'm still a customer. So I'm a, I'm a customer for 24 years of Amazon. Um, and I'm assume this is probably the same case for all of you. Uh, but there might be, so, so in, what I mean is that in general, customer lifespans in, in uh, e-commerce tend to be could be very long potentially. Um, uh, but in some cases, they are not. Uh, and we need a way to, to estimate them. And uh, there are two actual ways to estimate them. The first one is look at your database of all the transactions. And for all your repeat customers, try to calculate the difference between the first order. Like, as I said, in, the, in the, my Amazon case, my first order was in 1998. And the last order, and I think actually my last Amazon order was two days ago. Yeah, so that's why I would be, a, a, if you do that for all your customers, you eventually get um, your average customer lifespan. Or another way to do that is to work on churn. Is everybody here familiar with the concept of churn? Let me pause for a second. You, you raised your hand because you are, or? Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, about the estimation how many of the customers will leave you, so to say. Uh, during, during a period, yeah. yeah. So, 
Yeah, exactly. Let's say that your churn is 20%. That means that if at the beginning of the year you have 100 customers, at the end of the year, of those 100 customers, 80 will remain and 20 will have left. If that's the case, I can prove you, and I don't want, I don't want to do that because this is, uh, this is more academic, that would be very academic, but I could prove you that the customer, life, uh, the customer lifespan, the average time that a customer stays with you would be the inverse, so one divided by the annual churn rate, and then it would be expressed in years. And actually, this is a much better, uh, much better, much more accurate way of predicting um, lifespan than the other one. Okay, uh, so again, in our hypothetical uh, e-commerce, let's assume that our average customer lifespan is three years, then um, if you look at that, uh, you just can uh, multiply the three, the three components and we would get to an LTV, a lifetime value of $71.94. However, again, and it gets, it's a little bit more complex because when you have long customer lives, uh, more than two years or like 24 years, like my case with Amazon, you need to take into account what uh, financiers call the time value of money. The fact that one euro today is more valuable than one euro a year from now. Yeah? And it's a slightly more complex formula, which is called the annuity formula. Uh, but you can plug in the numbers and you get, what that means is that the, the, the value that you get from the first year is bigger than the value that you get from the second year. It's bigger than the value you get on the third year because that money is less valuable to you because, it's, um, uh, because you need to discount it at a certain interest rate. Like in this example, where the actual lifetime value is $68.57 instead of 71.94. Yeah. That's how you calculate lifetime value for e-commerce. Any questions so far? Okay, so what about, and we said what is important is to make sure that the lifetime value is bigger than your customer acquisition cost. So what the hell are customer acquisition costs? Well, customer acquisition costs are all the money, is all the money, including also salaries of, 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 of the time of the people that spend time doing that, that you spend getting customers dividing, divided by the number of new customers acquired in that period. So what do you include in your customer acquisition costs? So you, 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 if you're doing marketing and you're putting up Google or Facebook or Instagram ads, all that money. If you have a sales team, you have to include the salaries of the sales team. If you have a marketing as well, if you use agencies to design your ads, you need to include that. If you have publishing costs uh, for your ads as well, uh, or production costs if you do video. Um, the cost of running your home, your website, uh, because that's where you attract your, your customers to. That's also part of your customer acquisition cost. If you're paying commissions to your sales team or to partners or to anybody uh, in affiliate programs, that's part of your CAC. And important um, because remember that there was a model called the freemium model where you give the product away for free uh, in the hope that some people will actually like it so much that they will uh, pay a subscription the cost of those free trials that you give away for free, that's a customer acquisition cost. Um, so what about lifetime value in a subscription? Well, the concept is the same. Uh, obviously, what we want to calculate is how much money, how much value we're getting from every customer in our customer base over their time that they're gonna remain a customer for us. Um, but the way to calculate it is slightly different. Uh, and it's slightly different because it's a different model. It's not transaction based, you know, when people just buy today and might not come back to your website, 
but they actually pay a subscription, whether it's monthly or annual uh, for your product, for your digital product. So in this case, uh, what we look at is what we call ARPA, the average revenue per account. But remember, revenue is uh, not all of the value because uh, whether you pay a $10 subscription like Netflix, it costs Netflix some money to deliver their videos to you. So you have to multiply that revenue uh, by the gross margin that your, that, that your company has. Uh, and then you multiply all of that by the average customer lifespan, the same uh, as, as we did before. And uh, in terms of ARPA, uh, I'm just gonna mention that companies, there are some companies that offer monthly plans, you know, uh, and, and some of them are like, like, like Netflix. This is where I took this slide from. Uh, depending on quality, you can choose how much, you know, uh, how much you pay from $7.99 to $17.99 in this case. Or other companies like uh, Disney Plus uh, to uh, continue with the example of, uh, of video streaming. Uh, they let you choose whether you want to pay uh, a monthly subscription or an annual subscription. And I'm gonna uh, drop a, a question to the audience. Why do they uh, let the annual subscription be cheaper? Why they offer it cheaper? I would assume it's because Oh, sorry, Dominic. No, you go on, Matthias. That's all okay. right. Hey, I, so my assumption is that they do it cheaper because then they get the guarantee uh, that this uh, subscription uh, subscription is at least um, prolonged, so to say, for one year, and. So they have a higher overall probability and can give some discount, which is more or less the overall principle of giving discounts. Exactly. It's because uh, they know that if you pay monthly, you might churn more easily than if you pay uh, yearly. And in total, they're, they're willing to, get, to give you two months, which is almost 20% discount, uh, a little bit less. Uh, they're willing to give you that 20% because they're, they will still make more money uh, on average than if you buy the monthly because a lot, some people in the monthly will churn, right? And will not stay the whole year. Yeah? That's exactly right. So it's about lifetime value here in this case. And plus as a CFO, it's better to have the money now. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, particularly particularly with 10% inflation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> And, 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 and we said, uh, apart from the revenue per account, so how much are you getting from each of your customers on average, um, you need to apply a gross margin. And here I have an example. So it's, again, it's illustrative. Uh, so I've, I've made up the numbers, but uh, I've worked a, a lot and many years in, in software as a service. So I can tell you this is pretty much directionally right um, of how these companies uh, calculate their gross margin, you know, uh, and what are the biggest costs that they have. And in the case, for instance, of Salesforce, um, which is a big um, customer relationship management software that it's basically the standard um, that uh, every company uses to manage their, their sales and their, and their customer uh, uh, relationships. This is what it would look like. So on top of the, uh, apart from the subscription, you have to subtract what it costs uh, Salesforce to host uh, their software in the cloud, whether it's on Amazon Web Services or Azure from Microsoft or on the Google Cloud. How much they probably are going to be paying a little bit uh, of money to other companies uh, that they use as part of their product. Uh, uh, companies like Intercom, Datadog, or Algolia that do very specific things um, uh, uh, for Salesforce, for, in the Salesforce product. Uh, and they're going to be paying uh, the customer success team. The customer success is your relationship manager, uh, 
the the people that will train you how to use the software that will check up on you every now and then to make sure that you're getting value from the from the software that you bought um, and they're going to be subtracting also the cost of the support team uh, both the, the team and the associated tools with it and after you subtract all these costs um, what you get is the gross margin and again uh, well, not again, but um, to be noted, uh, and maybe this is the reason why SaaS is so popular uh, among venture capitalists, best-in-class SaaS companies typically have, uh, well, they have very high gross, gross margins, north of 75%, and some of them even in the 90 plus percent. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we're gonna get to something that does not happen in uh, in uh, in e-commerce, but might happen in software as a service, which is the concept of net negative churn. So we said that churn, Matthias, if you remember, is the percentage of your customer base that stops being your customer in a certain period, right? However, many of these companies, they have structured their pricing and they have a set of a portfolio of products that actually, while some customers can churn, other customers can, during the course of that year, increase the amount of money that they spend with you. That's called an expansion, right? It's when when you go from the 799 plan to the 17.99 plan on Netflix, you know, that's an expansion. And what happens is that the best in class companies are able to get more money from their existing customers through these expansions and upgrades than the money that they lose. Uh, the subscription money money that they lose from customers that churn or downgrade and if that's the case you have what we call negative churn now mathematically you know that if you divide uh well that in that case your your annual churn rate instead of 20 percent uh as the example before if you have negative churn you cannot calculate it because actually what happens is that your customer lifespan is infinite, right? Uh, and that's and, and then you would have infinite time, lifetime value too, mathematically. And that's why these companies all put so much effort. Uh, of course, they put effort in minimizing churn, in making sure that you enjoy and you you get value from their products. Like Netflix is continuously launching. New, 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 new shows, new series. Uh, Salesforce is improving their product every day, you know, uh, launching new things. Um, but at the same time, they're putting a lot of effort in expansions and upsells because if they reach negative churn, their customer lifetime value is infinite. And they will be growing even if they don't manage to sell to a, to, to a single incremental customer which they also do, of course. All right. Uh, what's the catch with all of this? Um, so with CAC and LTV, it's that, uh, well, not the catch, but uh, something to be aware of is uh, that like many things in life, uh, uh, it's 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 harder than it looks, yeah. And there's a concept again. This is from microeconomics, which is the concept of diminishing returns. It means like if you have a very good LTV and uh, at the beginning, and it costs you very little to acquire customers, that's probably not going to be the case in the future because the first customers that you're going to acquire at what we call the low hanging fruit or the fanatics or your friends, you know, and they know you and that's why it's so cheap to acquire customers. But every incremental customer you get, it's gonna be more costly to acquire and it's probably ha gonna have a lower LTV. 
So it's a constant struggle. You have to be prepared to constantly be improving your product and your processes to overcome this. And one way to do this is to look at cohorts uh, and to look at whether you're improving your uh, retention or, 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 or churn rates uh, cohort by cohort. Uh, and this is a very neat analysis uh, that you can do for your business. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an example. The question so far on uh, unit economics, because that's all I wanted to share about unit economics. I would have one, Carlos, with respect to this uh, net negative churn rate. You said that is something that is not available in e-commerce. But in e-commerce, when you imagine you have customers leaving you in a period, the others could nevertheless buy more, resulting in the same effect. Isn't that right? Yeah, you could, yeah, uh, like mathematically. But I think what you're talking to is, and I'm going back, sorry, it's taking me a little bit is what you're doing is you are trying to either increase the average value per transaction or the number of transactions per period of the customers that are staying with you, right? Mm -hmm. so you, you're right that there's still something you can do to increase your life, the lifetime value of your customers. And that's actually why, uh, sorry, why you have, again, Well, you have all these offers, you know, again, that yeah, you have all these exactly, offers, right? right? That, that's exactly right. It needs to compensate for the customers that are only going to buy once and never come back to you, right? Yeah. Okay, let me go quickly to the slide that we were talking. But, but yeah, so, so it's, 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 it's similar to net, net uh, negative churn, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, so the objective of that is in general to increase your lifetime value. Uh, it's not exactly the same as having net negative churn because net negative churn mathematically just means, okay, if you achieve that, your lifetime value is always increasing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. I, I would have one more question. Sure. Um, when I got it right in your calculations of this, um, the customer lifetime value should be significantly higher than the customer acquisition cost. Yeah. You, you do not really represent these fixed costs. Uh, is that right? Yeah. That's okay, right. so that fixed cost must be somehow covered in this three to five, so to say. The idea is, that's a, that's a great question. And again, uh, probably let's go to the fixed costs, yeah. The idea is that because your market is big, if you have your customer, your lifetime value is three to five times, three or more times bigger than your uh, customer acquisition costs, for every customer, you're getting something positive. Yes, you're, you're, you're covering your variable costs and a little bit of your fixed costs. And because we assume that your market is big and actually as humanity continues to get more digital and companies get more digital, it's growing. We assume that at some point you will cover your fixed costs, but we don't worry about that now when you're a startup. When, we're, when you're yeah. a startup, we just worry that for each customer, you are able to make some money. Yeah. Okay, That's so the, and this is also this uh, positive cash flow, so to say, that That's, you had uh, on one of the slides before. Yeah, that's, cash flow break even exactly. That's that that will come later when you're just make sure that your business model you're making money and not only you're making money you're 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 able to to every um, period every month every year get more and more customers. You have found a repeatable and scalable yeah. business model, right? Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
And okay, I'd have an additional question to that. Um, oh. Because we're speaking about startups, um, and mostly startups don't have a kind of a static, a stable, stable um, market, but they're, for example, at the scaling phase. And talking about gorillas and and Flink and Co, they're all the, the burn rate is exceptional, and it's it's uh, huge. Uh, and I'm pretty sure for some phases they're even um, willing to to have higher customer acquisition costs than uh, lifetime values or so on uh, because they want to become the category leader and kind of and it's it's way other um dimensions coming into the calculation than than we're talking about right now is that true for for some phases or in, in some strategic uh, situations yeah i'm I, i i haven't seen the numbers of gorillas i would assume that still their their customer acquisition costs is smaller than the lifetime value. Actually, what they say is that they are after some period, and I don't remember whether it was six months or 12 months or 18 months, after some period where they open a city, they're able to make it profitable. So that means they have positive unit economics in that city. There's a different thing is that this is a winner takes all, all market and there's a lot of competition. So how quickly you can open new cities matters and that's why they're raising money like crazy and they're deploying a lot of money into opening new cities because they want to, to be the first uh, and actually what ha what is what has, has happened now is that uh, it has turns out that they have not been very efficient at opening new cities and uh, maybe some of the cities that they have opened they are not able they don't think they're going to be able to make them profitable and they're like cutting back a little bit but the reason the reason But okay, two, two messages here. The first one is, is I'm sure they were they were they were at least at the beginning looking at unit economics because they said some cities are and in this case the, their unit is the city where they operate rather than the customer. Yeah. Uh, they're they're able to make that to operate them profitable. And the other thing is this is a race against time, so they need to be quick. That's why they need to raise a lot of money and spend it very quickly. Okay, and then another question. Don't want to go on your nerves, but it's interesting. <laughs> so, if you look at um, Facebook and, and other content creators uh, that um, that had had a very very long tail economics uh, in order to to have a, a profitable business model at all, um, so is there other situations where you say um, the the market is so early stage you can't even calculate those? numbers but you should you should still um, pursue <laughs> to to dominate the the market or create the market and the demand yeah so uh that's that's a, that's a good uh, a good point because um you can have great unit economics but if you don't have a product market fit it doesn't matter you know if you don't if you're not building something that people want and people want in huge numbers It doesn't matter whether you're able to make three dollars of a customer after spending only one, you know. Uh, so again, that's something to take into account. Uh, that the first thing is product market fit. You know, like you're building something that people want, and there are a lot of people that want that, right? Then it's when we talk about how to make sure that when we deliver that we are able to make money of how we structure, how we charge for it. Then we look at unit economics and then we look at what I'm going to talk about now, uh, time permitting, which is about uh, planning for the future and managing your costs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good, so I said at the beginning, a third thing uh, that the best startups have uh, is a good handle on their costs. Uh, and why is that? Um, well, uh, a couple of concepts I want to throw in at the beginning before going into some uh, learnings. Uh, the first thing is, uh, I call it the iron rule of startup business plans, um, is that cost, costs are like your mother, revenues are like your father. You can only be sure of the former. You can only be sure about how much, you can only really control how much you spend. Because your revenues, you don't know how many customers you're going to get. You don't know at the beginning when you're very early how much you're going to be able to charge for your product or service. It's very hard. 
Um, the other thing is the concept uh, that Paul Graham uh, mentions, it's ramen profitability. Until you find product market fit and, uh, and until you find your business model, you should just be, you, try, you should try to be ramen profitable, which means just cover your founders living expenses, your rent, your food, you know, uh, don't even pay for a lot of extras, you know, uh, 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 going to the movies or anything like that. Just pay for your basic living expenses until you're sure that you've built something that people want, right? Uh, and finally, there's a reason uh, the book is called Lean Startup, you know? There's a reason for that. It's, it's about not wasting money, okay? So how would I project revenues when I'm building a business plan, a business model? Well, they say, just, just make sure that the graph goes up and to the right, right? Um, now, investors and, and, and people like me, like when I analyze business plans, business models, we know as little about your future revenue as you do, you know? You, so just be ambitious, you know, show that you are willing to take a majority of the market but be realistic as well, because you don't want to look like a fool. You, know? you don't want to say you're going to build a $1 billion or 1 billion euro company in two years, because nobody has ever done that. You know? Second point, I call it uh, P times Q. Yeah? P times Q comes from price times quantity, should make sense. It should be in line with your business model, and you should have tested your assumptions of what you're pricing, yeah? how much are you charging for each, to each customer or, 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 or to each transaction, and how many customers and, uh, you're gonna have in each period, and how quickly are you going to acquire them? And here we get, uh, Dominic, to the question that you had before about uh, how many business models, I call them here revenue streams, can you have uh, as a startup? I would say focus on the main one, uh, from your business model, the one that you have tested and you think it's scalable and repeatable and add other streams later. Uh, but nobody's going to believe that you're going to be able to build a subscription and sell t-shirts and sell data and sell services and three or four other things in year one, right? Because nobody can do as many things. You have to be, you have to choose. Something about how do you estimate startup costs? So the first thing is, let's be consistent. They should be aligned whenever possible with your revenue, right? Check ratios, you know, that do the ratios make sense of your revenue to some of your costs, you know, like your, uh, your revenue to your number of salespeople or your revenue to your marketing spend or your revenue to your um, uh, investment in, in, in technology. You know, that, that should make sense. In today's day and age, people is likely to be your biggest cost. So make sure when you build a, a plan for the future that you take into account how quickly you're able to hire because hiring takes time. How many people can you hire and how much can you pay? You should also show, if possible, not everybody has, that you have built companies or you have run companies and know how to do that. Um, a clear red flag I see many founders do is that they underestimate the number and people of investment required for the revenue they're projecting. Uh, Matthias, you said you're a computer scientist. I, well, I'm an engineer uh, initially by initial background. I, and you know, engineers, we use buffers and safety coefficients all the time. Be a good engineer where you're planning your costs because things take longer and cost more than expected. You know, and we, have a, we have an example here in an airport around Berlin, right? Yeah, but also in software engineering, it happens all the time. Absolutely, yeah. And 
only scale costs, only double down on investment when you're sure that it will work. Until then, just experiment, you know? I'm just working with a company and they just decided that they had to lay off uh, a team of six people that they had uh, hired six, seven months ago to do something, to do outbound because it's not working for them. It's a, it's a sad story, but it proves exactly this. They hired six people at the same time to do something that they didn't know it was gonna work. The way to do it the startup way is you hire one or two, and once you see that it works, then you hire more, okay? Sounds very logical, and actually startups are all a lot about common sense, and management is a lot about common sense, but not a lot of people are able to do that. Um, Just finally, one question here, uh, Carlos, but um, uh, maybe about the first and the last point. Um, some things you will only find out a bit later, or you need some initial investment where you can't directly cover the costs. And uh, sometimes you just need the time to bring it to a certain size and then see how it works. That yeah, and it, that, is, that is okay, but you should aim at reducing that minimum a critical size to, to as little as you yeah, can. Yeah, that's for sure. Right? Yeah. And that's why the, I recommend the book Lean Startup that talks about MVPs and MVPs should, it's not just about your product, it's also about your organization and how you, yeah. how you deliver, how you sell, how you service and, and start small, do experiments and then when they work, you scale them. And finally, um, when you're building a business model, typically the reason why people build business models or financial models is because they want to get venture capital money. The first thing I'm gonna tell them is look at other sources of funding first. Not all companies require VC money. Um, uh, and actually that's perfectly fine. You know, they're, 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 they're businesses that you can you, you don't need an investor to be there to make uh, good money and to and, and to be successful and to make a successful company right um second point don't ask for too much money it's not free no matter what they tell you um it's not free money third point and again i see a lot of founders make this mistake it's like oh but in my third year i'm gonna have a profit of 25 million euros. And you know, like you don't need to, to show that in a model. Um, VCs, investors know that that's not gonna be true. So it's actually more about when you get money from investors, you set some goals about things that you want to achieve, some experiments, some, some hypothesis that you want to test uh, and achieve with that funding and how that will impact the value of your company, whether it's building a prototype or getting your first 10 customers or entering a new country, but just focus on milestones, the money that you need for that, and don't worry about building a profitable uh, business model. That comes much later, yeah? Finally, a uh, good rule of thumb is when you ask for money, after taking all this into account, how much you need for all the things that you want to achieve, just ensure that you get 18 to 24 months and then add some buffer, right? like good engineers do. So uh, with this, I will pause for a couple of minutes because this is the end of my presentation before uh, saying goodbye. Um, are there any final questions or remarks from anybody? about the buffer you want to add to the 18 or 24 uh, month so you would uh, ensure you finance more time than that and how long should the buffer be and, and what what's the sum uh, of time you um, suggest to finance yeah it's it's rather than time i would i would just add like a 10 percent buffer or something like for unforeseen things you know yeah all right thanks
And uh, you said uh, VC money isn't for free. Um, what's the what's the cost of VC money? And in what case would you try to uh, to fund yourself other than through VC or business angels? Yeah. So uh, well, that's that's a very that, that, that's a very deep question. Um, but like the the. So the, the, the cost, if you analyze it from a financial point of view, the cost of equity, the cost of, uh, you're basically, when you get VC money, you're, you're selling a part of your company. You're selling a big part of your company, typically 20 to 30%. Um, so there, it's, it's, it's a lot of dilution that you're gonna have to bear. Um, and not just that, but they're gonna ask for a lot more control of many decisions than what that 20 to 30 percent warrants you know they're going to have they're going to have the power to fire you many times they're going to have the power to veto you hiring people uh, and making decisions so you have to be very aware of how much it costs you now what is the alternative it depends on the company it depends on the situation uh, if you if you can start small if you have savings if you can uh, uh, bootstrap, so uh, uh, use your own resources, and or if you can build a service businesses, a service business uh, while you build a product, you know, and get money doing consulting, you know, for example, that. But be aware that might be longer, but might be cheaper. In the end, it's it's a choice, and you have to be aware of the cost and the benefits of each of each alternative. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Carlos. Okay, so um, just to summarize, we looked at, uh, 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 based on my experience, some learnings from, from, from building, analyzing, and investing in companies, in business plans. Uh, three learnings that I had is that the best companies have a clear business model that is consistent with the company strategy. They have strong unit economics, and they have a good handle on their costs. And... I just want to say stay in touch. Uh, you have my contact data here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter on deep tech and entrepreneurship. If you want to subscribe, happy to. Um, and I'm going to be doing an announcing on my social media uh, business and final model, finance model clinic uh, every last Friday of the month, starting uh, in September. Uh, you can sign up there and I can take a look at your business model and give you some advice for free. So that's all. Thank you very much.